Okay, good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock on the dot, and we are about to get started. Um, I am Rebecca Sawwasser. I'm the executive director of the Red Sox Foundation, and um, you are joining us this morning for the WIN event, um, a Red Sox Foundation and Women's Foundation of Boston uh, initiative. And this uh, morning, we'll be discussing fundraising strategies in the new normal. So if that's not the Zoom you're supposed to be on, that's what we're talking about. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, we're glad you're with us this morning. It's, I've got to say, a little bit weird to be speaking to close to 150 people, but I can only see five right now. Uh, but we know that you're out there. and We really appreciate you spending this time with us. Um, we are going to jump right in because we actually have a lot to get through. And we have four amazing women joining us and giving us their time and expertise uh, around this topic, which I know is so important for so many of you. Um, again, just a few quick housekeeping things before we jump in. There has been a little bit of technical difficulties uh, with a few of our participants and, and organizers around internet and connection. So if something pops off or someone has to jump off, we will get through it. it where this is a learning practice for all of us. First time using the Zoom webinar, but it'll be crazy, it'll be fun, but it'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Um, so please just bear with us if there's any technical difficulties. Uh, as I mentioned, there's about 140 participants out there this morning. We appreciate all of your time. What you're looking at right now are six of us. Uh, Christina Gordon and myself will be your co-hosts, and then we have four distinguished um, female executives with us this morning. We have Lori Britton, Tara Small, Kristen Sherman, and Shoma Hawk. And we're very grateful for your time this morning. They'll get into their bios in a moment and we'll get right into questions. But before we do, I just wanted to take a little bit of time um, to address the topic, which I'm sure is on everyone's mind, which has been on my mind. And I think we'd be remiss without addressing it. Um, and you know, it goes without saying that there's a lot happening in our country right now. Uh, when we, let me back up. When we thought about having this conversation, it was at the beginning of COVID. We recognized that for so many nonprofits, it was, honestly a make or break situation because fundraising became so almost impossible in this atmosphere of not being able to convene people how do you fundraise with that and then you know coming off of that then how do you leverage online resources like zooms to make up some of that lost revenue um and then we transitioned into a space of, of coming out of that craziness and uncertainty with covid into a far deeper graver uh, situation in our country. And that is um, in response to the too many deaths of black Americans that have happened at the hands of our, our nation's police departments. And for me, it has been an emotionally exhausting time, um, personally, as a black woman, feeling the um, range of emotions from rage to sadness, to hopelessness, to fear, um, fear for my children, fear for my life, um, it, it is, it, and then of course you have to put your hat on and be mom and be spouse and be boss. And it's, it's a hard, heavy time. And like so many of you, like I said, you feel hopeless. Um, but what I will say is that knowing that there are women out there like you that are working in this space, while your mission might not be specifically in social justice or equity, we together, I know that all of us are committed to this cause in some way, shape, or form. And for me, coming into this conversation this morning has actually been one of the lights across the last few weeks, knowing that I was going to be surrounded, albeit not in person, with the energy of women that are committed to being better and making our society and our communities and our people better has brought me some sense of hope. Um, and so I just wanted to share that because I'm sure it's top of mind for all of you. Uh, I also wanted to share that I do feel encouraged by being part of a small group at the Boston Red Sox that is helping to strategize and think um, progressively about what our strategy is in response and uh, to addressing some of these social justice issues. And so to date, I felt encouraged about some of the movement that the Red Sox have made, which is in no particular order, convening all of our staff around a deep, raw conversation on race. Um, we put together a comprehensive resource guide of books, of videos, of activists, of ways to donate and take action and petitions. And that can be found on redsoxfoundation.org. I encourage you all to look at it. Please share it, please use it. Um, 
to you know making Juneteenth a company holiday and convening our staff, all staff on Juneteenth to talk about the meaning of that holiday and the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. Um, and these are just small, tiny things on a longer journey that we are committed to at the Red Sox around this issue, which again, for me is, is so critically important at this time. But um, I, I don't mean to deviate, but again, I wanted to address that um, because for me, it's something that's in, in, incredibly important um, I will turn now to my co-host, Christina Gordon, who has, like I said, been, been there from step one in the creation of the WIN Network, the Women in Nonprofit Network, um, and has been doing some equally amazing work over at the Women's Foundation of Boston. So, Christina? Oh, hi. Thanks, Becca. Uh, as I've said before, it's always challenging to follow Becca. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so... Um, I'm the executive director of the Women's Foundation of Boston. If I haven't met you, I've met a lot of you. I know I have. Um, and our mission is to economically empower women and girls because we feel that equality and justice for all, including women and girls, um, is critical. So we are absolutely in that space and um, just keep moving ahead, upward and onward, upward and onward, moving ahead. And so... That's our mission. Um, in terms of recent, we um, created the Women's Foundation of Boston Response Fund in the middle of March. When we realized we were on a call with 275 funders across Massachusetts, and we realized that there was not one relief or response fund set up for women and girls or even had women and girls in their description, despite the fact that women have been the hardest hit by this um, economic and health crisis. Um, so we created that and we're on about halfway to our goal of a million dollars and we've already dispersed a fair amount of money emergency grants to a lot of women and girls serving organizations. Um, and we just keep moving forward and making, um, we're really making a giant impact on women and girls serving organizations in greater Boston. And our work today is more important than it was two weeks ago and it's more important than it was six months ago. So that's our story. We're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to have had involved with uh, uh, Becca and the Red Sox Foundation in the creation of women's, uh, the Women in Nonprofit Network because this is a, our wheelhouse, all about convening and empowering women um, and to, to improve and move onward and upward. So thanks. Great. Um, thank you, Christina. And I actually forgot to mention that during this conversation, you will be able to, as participants, type in any questions that you have. So at the bottom right of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A button. You can type in a question. It will be viewable to all participants, but it will find its way to me. And I'll be able to directly ask it to any, if you can note whom you want to ask the question to, I can ask it to that panelist directly or if it's a general question, I can ask it generally. So please make sure you take advantage of that feature because we definitely want to hear from you. We do have some pre-existing questions and I know some participants sent in questions before the event began, so we'll get to those as well. Uh, before we jump into questions, I do want to take a couple minutes, have each one of our distinguished panelists introduce themselves. Um, I, will, I would love to have Lori, if you wouldn't mind starting yourself, just giving a quick overview of who you are. Oop, and you're muted, Lori. Okay. There we go. Okay, I'm muted. There you go. You're good now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technology. We are all getting so used to <laughs> well, Unfortunately, I feel like, but you know, we'll get through it. Um, so I am um, have born and raised in Boston. I'm actually fourth generation Bostonian, which I'm very proud of, um, and have been working in Boston in the nonprofit sector since I graduated from college. I won't say when, but whatever, 25 years ago, um, uh, 1992, 25 or so years ago, I started working here in Boston. First started at the Boston Foundation, which is where my eyes opened up widely and um, excitedly to the nonprofit sector and how much of an impact it has in our world and on our lives. And I definitely am someone who was um, shaped by nonprofits as a kid, had lots of experiences in local organizations, youth leadership organizations. So definitely understand the importance and impact of the nonprofit sector, um, absolutely understand the impact of nonprofits on the lives of women and girls and people generally who are marginalized. And so my passion is really supporting organizations is to support that work. 
Um, and I don't know if I'm hearing feedback. Are you all hearing feedback? Just a tiny bit, but you're good now. Okay. So i um, just excited to share with uh, the folks here on this Zoom call about what it means to now exist in this COVID reality. Um, and frankly, in this, as uh, uh, Rachel, uh, Rebecca so, um, so eloquently stated, this reality of just social injustice that is now um, really just hitting us right square on. Um, and, and it all kind of converges. It all kind of relates. I mean, as, as uh, Christina said, COVID has impacted women and girls. It has impacted people of color. And I think so the root causes of all of that are the same. Um, and I think we are all poised and privileged to be in positions where we can actually make a difference. And so it's just, again, a privilege to be able to be a part of this conversation. Well, thank you so much. And I think you almost called me Rachel, which everybody almost does. Rachel <laughs> Rollins, who just like her. <laughs> is my sister. If you call me Rachel, it's a compliment. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, no, it's great. Um, so Tara, I'll actually jump to you to give your bio, if you don't mind, if you can go next. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Tara Small, and I am the executive director of One Loves Boston Region. I'm also a Boston native. I grew up in East Boston. Um, I have a background in social work and public health. Um, and uh, much like Laurie, um, has spent all of my career in sort of Boston-based nonprofits, actually spent some time at the Boston Foundation um, as well. But I've worked in a variety of issues from substance abuse to education um, to gang violence. Um, and I'm just, I'm really excited to be here. One Love is an organization that is focused on educating young people about the difference between um, healthy and unhealthy relationships. It was found in, in, founded in honor of a young woman who was killed by her ex-boyfriend. And so um, while fundraising in this time clearly is challenging, it's been an interesting position to be in at One Love, um, responding to COVID and obviously the way that sort of elevated um, the issue of domestic violence and then also Black Lives Matter and social justice and the intersectionality between um, marginalized communities and um, intimate partner violence. So I'm excited for this conversation and I thank you for having me here. Thank you so much. Um, and next we'll have Kristen Sherman share a little bit about herself. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I'm Kristen Sherman and I'm with Rehearsal for Life. Uh, it was formerly known as Urban Improv. Uh, a lot of people have heard of that. It was a um, long, long standing name. We rebranded a few years ago and we use theater as a tool for social change at the development director there. Um, my history has been uh, working mostly small and impactful nonprofits in the arts and education. Um, you know, marketing events, PR, fundraising, they kind of get thrown in that bucket. <laughs> um, and I seem to gravitate towards organizations that do spectacular and unusual events, um, including site-specific locations, outdoors, in all seasons, which is always a challenge in the Boston area, <laughs> um, and often with, you know, high-profile guests and speakers. But, um, you know, we, we uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. We, we were right at the beginning uh, in March was when our event really begins to uh, roll out and we had to make quick changes. And um, I had no idea how much I'd learn in, in a short span of time about fundraising and um, dedication and mission work. Um, as much as I thought I knew, it really blew my mind how much I have learned since then. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Well, you're, you're, we're grateful to have you and we're excited to learn some of the the key takeaways from this experience the last couple months. And so last but not least, we'll have Shoma Hawk share a little bit about herself. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Shoma Hawk. I'm the executive director of Steps of Success in Brookline. We are a community-based nonprofit educational organization. We support students who live in public housing in Brookline from fourth grade through college graduation, um, succeed on their educational journey. And our focus is very much on educational equity and closing the opportunity gap uh, for mostly students from low income families and students of color in Brookline. Um, I've been in the nonprofit sector in Boston and Brookline for about 20 years, working mostly in community development, always working in education. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. So let's jump right into the questions. As I mentioned at the onset of this conversation, we're here to talk about 
how does a nonprofit survive? How do we make money now that no one can get together? And so I think it would be helpful to start. And I think Kristen, you're getting a little bit into this. If each of you could share what you were planning to do before COVID-19 as a fun, major fundraiser, and then how did you have to pivot to make sure that you could still have a successful event to generate some much needed revenue for your nonprofit. So Lori, I'd love to start with you. Unmute again, just un unmute. Good, yes, I think so. Okay, perfect, uh, I have to remember that. So I'd like to um, speak from my experience working with Epiphany School. I work with a few nonprofits around Boston. Um, and so the Epiphany experience for me was quite a learning experience because when the COVID reality hit us, and I remember the exact date that it hit me, uh, it was March 9th and it was the day that New York City shut down. And I was actually at the Westin Hotel for a tasting. <laughs> having just left a board meeting where they told us we weren't having, we, we couldn't possibly have the event on April 17th. But we had this pre-scheduled conversation at the Westin to do this tasting to sort of, so we had to go in pretending, oh, oh yeah, we're gonna, you know, we're not sure what's gonna happen, but we'll keep moving forward. And part of it was because frankly, we didn't, we couldn't tell them at that moment, hey, we're gonna cancel this event because we didn't wanna risk losing $25,000 because that was the other issue. You know, once you have planned something and you're now in that cycle or in that sequence where you can lose money if you start canceling, it was a real cat and mouse game at that point. So anyways, we were just shocked. The beauty of uh, our situation at Epiphany School is that we actually had planned a video and that really is what saved us. We had a video production company engaged already. They had been on site at the school since maybe mid, early to mid February. So they had started the process of producing a video. Um, by the time we realized, look, we can't do this, for about 24 hours, I was just sort of shell-shocked. But then we rallied the team and decided, okay, we're gonna have to just put on a virtual event. We're gonna have to create and produce a video that will compel people to the story that is Epiphany, and we'll do it in a way that will allow us to still incorporate our students, our parents, our teachers, our board members um, and, and try our best to sort of create this, um, this experience where people can really walk into what it means to be a part of the Epiphany community. And um, we did a number of, we, so again, having that production company was critical because we were able to kind of create this product. Um, and so with that, we sort of, people were bravely willing to come into the school and do interviews. And we had a small chorus that did an, an, a, that assembled and put together a musical piece. Um, and it, it really was, uh, for me, an exemplary um, testament to what it means when people don't give up. And that is Epiphany's motto, never give up. So never give up on a child. And so we really did push through. And long, long story short, we were able to produce a series of trailers that related to this video. We were able to do a lot of lead up going into the event. So a couple of weeks out of the event, we started to give people previews and again, trailers and really build up the uh, momentum. We did a lot of outreach. We probably talked to no less than a hundred of our donors and said, you know, we're about to produce this, we're producing this video. We are still hosting our gala on the 17th. Please join us. So lots of build up, lots of momentum, lots of outreach, one-on-one -on -one conversation. So the key for me, the learning was, even though we couldn't see people in person and people were frightened to even go outside at that point, we kept calling people, talking to people. We had Zoom conversations. We would solicit people, you know, have a solicitation, had a couple of Zoom solicitations. Um, so we were, went forward with this video. We hosted on the 17th. We got lots of people to virtually serve as hosts using the Classy platform. That was amazing. People really did get into it. They really were impressed and moved by the story. Raised, all told for the event, over $800,000 during the, um, during the uh, weekend that the event sort of aired, we probably brought in about 300,000, which was a complete shock to me because I was completely convinced that we would never raise that much money or any money on online. I just thought it wasn't gonna, it wouldn't happen, but it did. Um, and so the other thing we did in terms of responding to COVID is we let people know, look, we're still, we're still functioning as an organization, even though we're not physically with our, ch with our kids in the building, we're providing food for them, we're providing therapeutic services. We are connecting with children and families daily and weekly. So um, 
people were able to understand, our donors were able to understand, hey, we are still in need of your services and support. So that was uh, critical in terms of our being able to continue to receive money. And in fact, people were really, when we put out an email saying, hey, we have created this uh, emergency relief initiative, can you please help us? People really did respond to that. So again, never giving up, thinking about ways to pivot and to tell the story differently in a way that relates to the current crisis is a thing that I think Epiphany School did really well. And as a result, its fundraising hasn't uh, faltered at all in this, in this um, period. That's incredible. Um, and I'm curious to know if anybody else on the panel um, kind of experienced the same thing, that there wasn't too much of a drop. Shoma, why don't we jump to you? Sure, thank you. Um, a lot of what uh, Lori said, I will echo as well. We were incredibly pleasantly surprised and shocked at the outpouring of support that we received. Um, and it's funny because those dates are, you know, ingrained in your mind, like school shut down on March 12th. On March 13th, we had an emergency meeting with our development committee where we just, you know, we saw the writing on the wall. And six weeks later, we were supposed to have an event at Boston University that uh, at that point hadn't actually decided to shut down yet. Um, so, you know, again, completely pivoted an event we'd planned for six months and turned it into a four week social media campaign, an email campaign. And every week we sent out an email to our supporters, letting them know we're still here, we're still doing good work, we're still connecting with our students. Um, you know, please support our efforts. And so, and this was something we had never done before. In fact, most of our fundraising to date had been done via snail mail. So it was a complete shift in how we did business. Um, and we were really able to connect with people again because of video, because of a few lucky things, um, like having some video in hand already, like people who are willing to do video on iPhone, someone on staff who could edit those in iMovie really well. Um, we had you know an incredible group of uh people in our development committee who were willing to spread the word in any way shape and possible that we're still having an event please support um so i, I know there's you know a lot more questions and there's a lot more i can add about technology etc so but i will leave it at that absolutely no and you, you we've Lori touched on a handful of the other questions too, but we, we, can, we can weave those in or we can come back to them. But um, Kristen, I think just sharing a little bit more about what your event was and, and what it turned into being would be great too. Sure. Um, so we uh, helped produce Band in Boston, which is an original um, musical and comedy review. It's a one night variety show featuring um, Boston's most high profile arts, culture, business leaders, sports folks, we always see Sam Kennedy. And uh, last year, I think we had Sam Horn uh, from the Red Sox. Um, but there's about 500 guests and they all convene on the House of Blues and there's you know, pre-parties. It's, like it's, it's like a party within a party within a party. There's nothing virtual about it. It is a, um, it has a brand in and of itself um, because it's been going on for so long. It, it started at Mamakin's, which if anybody's old enough, uh, you would know that's an old club <laughs> there on Lansdowne Street. Um, there's always people rubbing elbows like um, Aerosmith's Tom Hamilton with, you know, the historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's just this mashup of people you never get in one place. And so like everyone just said, um, the, as the dates came uh, together, you remember when, okay, uh, Governor Baker just said we can't have people more than 250. What does that mean? And we just started to, to put it together and the decision was being made for us. Um, unfortunately, but but fortunately, uh, we realized it would be unsafe, um, not just for anybody to come together and convene, but also we realized we work with so many businesses that have helped urban improv. Um, uh, it, it's a fundraiser specifically for urban improv. It raises the bulk of our budget. Um, it, it usually um, raises about $750,000. Um, so we do a lot of work in advance with sponsorship um, in advance and I'm grateful for always being a, a type A personality who's <laughs> driving sponsorships early because it really helped us be able to make sound and quick decisions um, uh, to, to say, okay, well, we can't cancel this, but what does this mean? Um, we realized all of our partners, their businesses were being impacted um, you know, every, every single person, the restaurants that partner with us for years and years, we, we do, um, they provide us all of the food and drink. Um, 
for this event. And we realized, oh my gosh, you know, they're not in business anymore. So it was a real um, sad uh, few, few days where we had all these decisions to make. Um, and so knowing we couldn't do our traditional pageantry um, and humor, it was just a lot of uncertainty of can we, can we have fun? What will this look like on a screen? But uh, like others, we happened to have just finished filming a lot of, um, of our program, just raw footage. And um, we do that every year. Um, and, and we just dug down into our mission and said, well, what do we do? We, we provide social and emotional uh, learning supports for um, uh, students in the Boston Public Schools. Um, and what can we do to start to present our, ourselves front forward? We have five or six weeks to go. So we basically drilled into our program and flipped the whole thing and broke our program down by what we present and how we interact with the kids and just reinterpreted that. Uh, I, I thank, thank my lucky stars. We have an amazing group of actor educators. Um, our ensemble is just an amazing creative team that came open hearted and just said, okay, this is how we should present it. And we actually re every week, we had a week to week breakdown of our, our program and why it works, um, culminating with our uh, final virtual band in Boston. And um, we had a few key um, people who, who did their own filming with iPhones. Jimmy Tingle is a big part of our event. And he, he filmed himself doing the pitch, the auction pitch. Uh, you know, he was phenomenal. And, and we just um, we just did our best, and it was it was shocking how how people really kept their pocketbooks open, um, and 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 provided our week to week sort of uh, instant feedback of how are we doing, um, while we were still serving the kids, uh, which was um, also something we we never we never stopped as long as we could um, present and connect with the teachers who get to the students. We we just decided to keep going, and we actually just wrapped up our um, school year last week with a group scene festival where we had a, um, a lot of our students submitted their ideas for performance and they had our actors act out. So hearing their words on the screen, um, we sort of inverted a lot of stuff, but it, it, it worked out well and um, uh, it's been exhausting and realizing we're all putting on, you know, little miniature television shows all day long and, and Zoom, it, it really uh, reframed everything we do, but um, I'm so grateful for the, the people who stick with us and, and uh, and, and recognized, um, you know, the work was still and more valid than ever. Yep, absolutely. Well, last but not least, Tara, if you want to share a little bit more um, about what One Love was doing and then had to pivot to do, that'd be great. And then the next few questions, um, uh, we don't have to have every panelist answer. Uh, we can just kind of fly through some of them because we're having some great questions come in from the uh, participants and the attendees. So Tara, Tara. Sure. So, um, as I mentioned, One Love is a national organization with six regional offices across the country, um, obviously Boston being one of them. And, and typically in the spring, we have a, a variety of um, major events um, throughout the regions, one of which is an event called One Night for One Love that we've had in Boston for the last um, three years. And, in, and um, this year we had an event scheduled um, in New York and also in Baltimore, a One Night for One Love event in sort of the April, May range. This was also a really special year for One Love because it marked the 10 year anniversary of Yardley's death. And so we had a lot of sort of um, exciting celebratory events to sort of honor, you know, her legacy um, and sort of celebrate all the good that had come from that tragedy. And so One Night for One Love in Boston was scheduled for May 5th at the state room. Um, they, ha they have actually been incredibly wonderful to work with. I've been, um, you know, it was sort of a concern in the beginning of, um, as you're all mentioning, sort of how to make that decision once you sort of started to plan these events and sort of start to pay, how do you, how do you sort of adjust mid course? And they have been wonderful to work with. And so as the national team got together to try to think about how are we going to, um, move forward, we started to think about what are the events that we have scheduled that we really could take digitally and do well. Um, and we actually made the really hard decision, despite the fact that sort of, I would say 30, about 30% 30 of our revenue comes from these major events in the spring, to push those events to the fall and hope that we could try to do them in person. Although now we're in June and it's probably looking unlikely that we'll be able to do that as well. But we did have an event scheduled, um, a local event scheduled in Baltimore, which is Yardley's hometown, um, for a sort of a fun uh, run and walk. Uh, it's called Yards for Yardley. It's sort of a concept that's been around at One Love for a while where local 
community groups or athletic teams or um, schools will sort of take on this yards for yardly challenge in which they will sort of infuse our education in some sort of movement um, to raise awareness about the issue. And so this event was scheduled in Baltimore on May 3rd, which is the anniversary of Yardley's death. Um, and we decided to sort of, that we thought we could sort of very quickly turn that into something um, virtual, particularly given that sort of folks were now at home and we were sort of seeing how folks were posting photos of themselves on their walks with their children or sort of doing some things that previously they hadn't had time to do. And really at the sort of spirit at One Love has always been about sort of building community and bringing people together in person to have conversations. And so we really were trying to think about in that spirit how, what, what is an event we can do to really bring people together? And so sort of virtual Yards for Yardley, a virtual movement, which we sort of coined it, uh, was launched and we ran it from April 3rd to May 3rd. Um, and we really tried to sort of think about the ways that we could engage. A lot of our work is based on um, empowering teen and campus ambassadors and volunteers really bringing other leaders into the conversation. And so we sort of use that methodology we called them Yards for Yardly Captains, and we brought our sort of closest supporters and volunteers together as we launched this and asked them to sort of help us think through um, how could they engage their families, their children, their neighbors, their networks in sort of this virtual movement. And I think the one thing I'll say, which was a little different from some of the other events that folks have talked about, is we, we really felt like at that time um, that we, we wanted to sort of manage the, the, the fundraising um, idea really delicately, and we unlike any year in the past had actually gotten to the fourth quarter in a pretty strong way. We typically, it's typically opposite. Most of our revenue comes in then, but we were sort of heading into that, um, that season strong. And so we made the decision to launch Yards for Yardly with a virtual, um, a vol um, so you could sort of opt into fundraising. It wasn't a requirement for participating. What was really exciting about Yards for Yardly is we had about 4,800 um, folks across the country join us in this movement and pledge yards. Um, and then we had about 1500 folks who sort of went the extra mile, as we called it, and agreed to sort of reach out to their networks um, and raise awareness and raise funding. Uh, we raised about $200,000 through the virtual movement. So um, it, we think it's actually, it's probably something we wouldn't have done without COVID-19, uh, but we think it's now probably something that will stay. People really sort of felt um, that it sort of maintained one love spirit and that it really helped them sort of be a part of something positive when people weren't feeling very positive about much. Um, and, and we were able to raise some revenue in a time when it was difficult. So we think it's something moving forward that could be even a bigger community fundraiser for us. Yeah, I think, you know, like us, we, it's interesting. We have been talking about doing things the way we've done them in co through COVID-19 forever. We've learned at the Red Sox Foundation that some of the work Ha could be so much more efficient um, given the, um, the limitations that we had access to through COVID-19, but now we're like, we're gonna do this going forward. Um, so it, there's somewhat of a bright side in some of this in terms of efficiencies and, and key learnings for I think nonprofits there. I do actually want each of you very quickly to just say, what is the best platform that you have found to run virtual events? Is it Zoom? Is it something else? And then why do you think that is the best one? So Lori, why don't we quickly start with you? Hi, so my experience is that the Classy um, platform was really effective and then using Vimeo versus YouTube for your video um, upload or, or sharing that video. One of the reasons is that if you all are familiar with YouTube, when you end a YouTube video, it automatically goes to some other random video. <laughs> And that can be confusing, even though I believe that relates to the viewers' um, choices, um, previous choices. But I know one of our virtual hosts raised it because she was confused when we were doing the test run. She said, I, when I end the video for Epiphany, I see a video of, I don't know, something she didn't really want to see. And so we thought, mm -hmm, okay, we don't want that to happen because if people don't understand it's actually their stuff, it could just be confusing right. and off-putting. So the Vimeo platform is much cleaner. You just see that video and over and that's it. And so that, you know, that was what we found to be most effective. Great. So Classy and Vimeo, I'm taking notes here, folks. Um, all right, let's go to Kristen. We, I will say we didn't, um, we didn't go the Vimeo route. We, we did ours on YouTube. And um, I think just due to the, the quickness where we had to pivot, same timing as Epiphany, 
but um, we already have a really robust YouTube site with a lot of videos, so it's just it sort of seems natural. Um, we did not do anything live. Um, I think now I might do it differently and be brave enough uh, to do a live um, thing. Um, we've done our, our theater programs live on YouTube, um, and that was through Zoom, and it's, it's definitely a masterful thing to, to, to witness, um, but it takes a lot of work. At the time, we didn't do that, um, and we just used our web page. We actually re we overhauled our web page and used that as our landing page. We didn't do anything special. Um, so, you know, I hate to say it, we didn't have even the, the, the technology in place other than what we felt was right of, available to us using YouTube and using our email and using our, our, um, our web page. Yep, perfect. All right, Shoma, what do you think? Um, like Kristen was saying, uh, we weren't brave enough to do an actual live event, quote unquote. Um, so we ended up using also YouTube Give Lively, which is a free um, donation platform. It's the first time we used it, it worked well. And then rallyop.com, which was our raffle web page, um, which also relatively free and easy to use. And we managed to pull all that together again in a relatively tech phobic organization um, and people figured out how to use it. So it went Good. well. Good. Tara. Yeah, so we um, we dedicated um, a web page to Yards for Yardley, which was really helpful, given the fact that we pulled it together sort of so quickly. Um, one challenge we did have was we couldn't get, we used Rallybound as our community fundraising platform, and we just, we didn't have enough time to integrate the system. So you could register on our website to participate, and then you had to register um, through Rallybound to, to also fundraise. Um, and I would just say, you know, one of the things that we, uh, we have been experimenting with on our program side, as well as um, sort of to culminate the event is um, Insta Lives. And we had a sort of a celebratory um, format at the end that was super fun. And it seems like many people are sort of gravitating towards that and are sort of getting used to it. And, and it's, a, it's sort of a fun, lighter, a little bit more informal way to, to get people together. Got it. Uh, Lori, I think you touched on the next question a little bit, but I'd love to hear thoughts around um, silent, live, raising the paddle, those types of auctions. How do you integrate that successfully in a virtual event? Have you found any tricks of the trade? Anything do you do prior to the event, leading up to the event, which I've seen? Is it better done during the event? Are we not even doing silent anymore? Would love, again, Laura, you can, you can start here. Um, any thoughts? Because you mentioned, I think you said 300,000. There was additional raised across the weekend or... Yeah, so that was just by having that classy platform, which is a fundraising tool. It's a fundraising platform. It's designed to raise money. It's designed to raise money virtually. So we actually didn't do, before all of this happened, we decided not to do a silent auction. Mm -hmm. We never do a live auction. We just find that the silent auctions are a lot, of, it's a lot of time spent to mm -hmm. coordinate and get all of that stuff. And it doesn't actually net the kinds of um, revenue that make it worth it. So we, we nix that going in. So the classy platform, just having that video up, having that, um, that tool where people were seeing, we actually had a matching gift challenge embedded in that. So that also allowed people to see, okay, if I give $10, someone else is giving $10 on my behalf. So we didn't do any auction. It was just the platform that allowed that, that to happen. And people yeah. just responded to that video. Totally. Um, does anybody else want to chime in from their event perspective? Everyone doesn't have to answer, but if you found a really cool way to, to generate additional revenue through an auction, either live, silent, or, you know, during the event, would love to hear it. Uh, auction, we did do a virtual paddle raise and yep. we did have matching gifts from do donors um, ahead of time and showed the thermometer going up over the course of the week. Um, and made it really clear, almost as if you were at the event, that you know a five hundred dollar pedal raise is this, and a thousand is this. Um, so we tried to make it feel like it was still a paddle. Yep. Yeah, I can only imagine how difficult additional fundraising is virtually um, through this time. So um, another kind of question, and I, again, Lori, I think you touched on this a little bit, is how do you felt was the best way to convey your mission? How do you get the cause of your organization? How do you ensure that that is coming through virtually during an event? And Lori, I think you mentioned with this video, you, you hired an organization to create this powerful video that probably was played during your event. So feel free to chime in on that and anybody else kind of 
con 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 connection to mission through this event. So I'll just quickly say, we actually got that um, video production was donated to us. So I would encourage all organizations to find those opportunities, even within your existing donor pool, they want to help out, maybe they have that capacity to do that. So we got this donated video production company, which was terrific. And I think the best way to, 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 com to share the mission and to make it compelling is to use the voices or engage, I don't use the wrong word, but engage the voices of the people who are partnering with you in the organization. So the, the, the teachers, the, in our case, the parents, the people who actually are being served by the mission and who we are working together with to, to carry that mission forward. I think having those stories being shared in their first person voice um, is powerful and important and to do it obviously in a way that's authentic and in a way that's respectful and in a way that they're comfortable doing it um, is the best way to, to ex expose and to share the mission and the passion around it. Thank you very much. Um, we actually just got a question that is, I think, worth, def all of the questions are worth asking, but this one I think fits nicely here is ticket prices. H how have you reshaped the cost of entry to these virtual events given that people are not convening? So does anybody wanna share how you adjusted and then justified the, the cost of entry to these events? What was it? I'll, I'll speak up. We, um, I mean, it was, Essentially, we realized the ticket wouldn't matter if we couldn't get anybody to watch. <laughs> so we realized our mission and our, and our getting the word out was the, the value was the ticket. I mean, if to just spread the word and have anybody else know about it kind of became a marketing trade off. Um, I, you know, we, we missed the, the money, the revenue that tickets would generate. But I think we spread the word in, in more meaningful ways. We asked people to share our videos everywhere. Um, when I think back now, I would probably build that into even the, the video itself, <laughs> um, more cues, more visuals to share to, you know, it, you know, we quickly had to become an advertising firm <laughs> kind of. Um, so that's what, what I would say we missed. Well, you missed the cash. I think that we, we reached people that never could have come to the event. You know, people who live in California, who, who know someone on the, the committee who you know realized oh now I can share this and, and so we saw some donations from places we didn't normally see um, because of, of that reason um, I don't know if that's the right answer but that's what, what we did no that, that's helpful um, you know another couple questions which are which are a top of mind for me at the Red Sox Foundation um, switching gears a little bit is because there has been such a need around COVID-19 and around some of the racial and social injustices that are happening in the country. How do you um, make your pitch as a nonprofit whose mission might not fit within those categories of work? How are you finding success in fundraising either through events and or through corporations or grants or, or sponsorships or anything? What's the trick there? I Tara, have... go ahead, yeah. Um... So it, 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 it's, it's definitely a question that we've been sort of thinking about at One Love, sort of, you know, how, how, do you, how do you authentically fundraise in this environment? And I think, you know, one of the strategies, although we're always sort of open to new revenue, of course, is really thinking about um, sort of leaning on our existing supporters, right? And really helping them understand what is it that we're doing how is it that what we're doing is intersecting with the other things that are happening in the world? Because I think it'd be really easy to sort of see yourself in some sort of silo, right? This is about relationship health. What does it have to do with Black Lives Matter? Or what does it have to do with COVID? It has a lot to do with all of those things, right? And so helping them, helping to just sort of make the case clear that while there may be other things right now that you want to take on and, and, and we agree with that and we think that you should, we just want you to fully understand what we're doing. And the other thing that we did is we really sort of flipped our entire programmatic um, educational platform to reach young people online. So we've reached over, you know, 6,000 young people and educators online. It's actually, to your point, Becca, it's sort of, there's, there's, a, there's a virtual series that now will always be a part of what we do. And so I think the other thing we've really just been trying to do is help people understand how we're responding to COVID. So not only just sort of aligning our mission with, with the other ways that um, communities are being affected by these these other social issues that are happening but also how are we responding what are the things that we're doing how are we stewarding the funding that you've already given us to ensure that we're continuing to do good work reach people where they're at those kinds of things 
So it sounds like in summary, making sure that you are staying and, and stewarding and cultivating the relationships with your key donors that are already invested and bought into your mission, as well as sharing with them the intersection across some of these other larger issues and how those issues are affecting your current mission to make sure they understand it's all somewhat connected exactly. in that way. Um, no, that makes complete sense. Um, Lori, Kristen, Choma, um, you do not have to add anything, but feel free. We have a ton of questions from the uh, audience that I'm trying to get through as well. So uh, another question, and this is one that I actually came up with because we at the Red Sox Foundation have seen a little bit of an increase from a certain demographic of donor. On our end, we're seeing more money come in from individuals than we are from corporations. And so I just wanted to ask if that's, if you guys are feeling the same way there and, and how are you shifting your focus to maybe um, yield uh, more revenue from the, that demographic. So um, anybody feel free to jump in. I think definitely that seems to be, a, a, well, that's been my experience as well, that individuals are so, people are stunned by, first we were stunned by COVID and how our country dealt with that and then how we were impacted, are, are being impacted by it. And then of course, uh, in the last month, the issues around racial injustice. So people are so desperate for ways to make a difference. I've had, you know, several individual donors say, what else can I do? Who else can I support? Where else can I lend a hand? You know, I don't, and I also don't want to just give money. I want to do something physically where can i go who's doing what so i think there's absolutely this um desire amongst individuals at all levels of capacity to give to lean in where um, they're needed most and so i think it, it really does present a great opportunity as tara said to really connect in with our existing donor base and make them understand how by supporting us they are doing something and here are the many ways that they can support we, we need of course we all need money but there are other things that we need as well. And so having them, um, helping them to figure out how they can lean in and feel like they're doing something that is meaningful and tangible during this time. And I believe that all of our organizations have a way to make those links, even if it's not, even if our work is not directly about social justice or directly about, um, you know, issues around basic human needs or, you know, feeding people. I think there are ways to make those connections in all that we do. Very well said. Um, Kristen, Tara, Shoma, want to chime in anything there? Um, great. Well, we actually have a, I want to be mindful of time because we're ending right at 11 o'clock here. We actually have some questions that are more related to some of the social um, justice work that's happening right now. One question specifically uh, came in that is a question about, and I'm just going to read it almost verbatim, which is how can white-led nonprofits best use their positions of privilege and power to fundraise and or amplify voices of organizations that are led by individuals of color in the community? So would love to hear anybody's thoughts there. How can white-led nonprofits best use their positions of privilege to amplify the voices of organizations that are led by individuals of color? Shoma, I have, yeah. I have one example um, specifically in Brookline. The Brookline Interactive Group um, is essentially a public access channel, but they've really pivoted their mission to really about be about amplifying community voices. And both you know them and a, a lot of other organizations around town have actively reached out to us and said, how can we support you steps? Tell us how we can send your videos out for your nonprofit um, event that became virtual. Tell us how um, your students need support so that they can then use their platforms, whether it's public access TV or, or um, online uh, um, newspapers, et cetera, saying, you know, Steps of Success is out there. They're doing this important work. They pivoted all of their programming to continue to support students of color in this community. This is how you can help Brookline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on this one? I, I'll ahead. just chime in something. Um, we, you know, like everyone, I think like Lori rightly said, everybody's been stunned and just sort of what do we do uh, at some level in different um, organizations. And I, I think listening, um, I think that that is, is what I'm finding the most valuable thing right now um, to, to listen and look at the long view of how an organization that 
may have long histories of how it's operated, how it will change, move, and be contemporary, um, and 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 be you know um, true to the mission, but keeping keeping everybody um, informed that ch times are changing. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's been our um, I think our reaction right now is just open ears. Um, yeah. And, and I will say one of the things that the Red Sox, given that we know one of our best assets um, is our platform on social media, um, given the, the number of followers that we have. And one of the ways we can be no, most impactful is exactly to this question's point is amplifying the voices of people of color. And so we've done um, and, and are committed to continuing to retweet, repost statements from uh, posts about truths and just uh, the work that's the great work that's happening from the amazing nonprofits across this country. Um, and so we've reposted, um, you know, videos from Black Lives Matter and NAACP, and, and uh, we'll continue to make sure that to, that we can leverage our platform to uplift their voices because our megaphone is is pretty large. Um, a question did just come in, um, shifting gears back to budgeting actually for nonprofits, given COVID. How have you adjusted your fundraising goals for this year? And I think one maybe way we can help answer this is if you even want to say what your budget was, your original target, and what it is now, given where you think you'll land in terms of fundraising. Lori, why don't we start with you? So um, I would my feeling, even though I will have to say I had to be brought along in this feeling. Um, in March, I was doom and gloom, it's over. <laughs> no one's ever gonna raise another penny. <laughs> um, this is go home, which was horrible. And then I, I quickly got myself together and decided to lead in, in my own thinking with faith and not fear. And so my belief now is that we have to press forward. I feel like now more than ever, people want to make change in our society. And so we have to take that for what it is and not say to ourselves, we must retreat and retract, but we have to dig in and make decisions about um, how we're going to survive as a nonprofit. I read an article about the fact that during the Civil War, there were lots of organizations that could have retreated and could have decided, oh my goodness, our country is in this incredible crisis. We're going to just shut down and not move forward. And had that happened, I can't recall the specific organizations, but a number of major institutions would that we have come to know, know and maybe love in some cases wouldn't have exist, would not exist today if that had been the case, if people had retreated during that major national, international crisis. Um, that was the civil war in the United States. So I don't, I think now nonprofits are needed more than ever. I feel like, so in, in Epiphany's case, we haven't retreated. The budget is the growth plan for next year is 5%. We had been at incredibly aggressive um, growth over the last five years of seven and a half percent on average every year, which is crazy. Um, so now we're at 5%, which is still in some, in most cases, pretty, aggressive um, to make that a goal. Um, and so again, we're not retreating because the work has to get done. The kids who go to that school need that institution to be there for it. So that's our approach at this point. I know every organization is different and people will have to make decisions, um, you know, based on what they see as their uh, pipeline and, and what their feedback is from their donors. Totally. Yeah. And just to give some perspective there, the Red Sox Foundation, we were at about originally 13, just over 13 million we were gonna raise this year and we're down to 3.5 is what we expect to bring in this year from a fundraising perspective. So um, Tara, Kristen, if you wanna just share those quick numbers, I know I'm looking at the clock here, what you were gonna raise and then what you think you'll raise. Tara, why don't we jump to you? Yeah, so nationally, um, One Love had sort of a seven to $12 million goal and I realize that's a giant gap, but we launched a, a capacity campaign this year. Um, to really sort of help us um, build some real capacity in leadership, uh, learning management system, some, some technology things that we need to do in order to reach um, some more folks. And so in many ways, that capacity um, campaign was really sort of what put us in this sort of positive position. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, we'll sort of break even around the $7 million mark. The Boston region is much less um, bright a picture. Um, the Boston region is relatively new to One Love. It's only a couple of years old. 
most of the revenue was generated through the event. All of that revenue got pushed to FY21. And so I'm grateful at this moment to be part of a national organization that can sort of, you know, we're sort of all working together, but that's sort of where we'll, we'll land. Got it. Yep. Kristen? Um, well, we're normally, a, we have a small budget, about a million and a half um, every year to year. And we're, we're trying to, um, I think our budget's going to land at about a million one a million one oh. um, so we've brought it down um, in terms of what we do we, we go into schools our, our our model has been blown up <laughs> so uh, we actually have um, you know an in-school program it's sort of invisible to the public eye um, but now it looks like you know we don't know we don't know how we will deliver um, so we have sort of just shifted how we do our budgeting in terms of we don't need buses, we don't need some of those things, but we're gonna need a lot of video. We're gonna need a lot of maybe technical equipment to be able to keep reaching students and maybe expand. Um, and you know, anybody can see what we do if they have a computer, a phone. Um, so we're sort of shifting our mindset on how we deliver our model um, and that we're trying to tell our story that way through our budget. Um, it's still in, a very fluid at this point, but um, you know, repackaging and retooling what we do, it's, been an exhausting few weeks, to say the least. I'm sure. Shoma? Um, I just wanted to echo what Kristen was saying in terms of, you know, part of this process about educating donors, that going virtual takes money. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money. And so there's still a story there to be told around fundraising, particularly with individual donors. We are not, ex you know, some portion of our budget comes from the state. We are not expecting miracles there, um, but we are still moving aggressively on the individual donor front because I do think, you know, they are our close, you know, our close community and donors really recognize um, what we're going through right now, what our students and families are going through and that, you know, that support needs to be there. Um, I am so, uh, for once, I'm like dreadful of the 11 o'clock hour because we have so many other great questions coming in. I, I, one specifically was asking about the fall and winter. Do we even try to schedule anything for later on this year, given the uncertainty? Is it even worth it? But I, I don't think we're going to have time to get into that question, but I appreciate, Bethany, that question that you sent in there. Um, we did want to save a few minutes because we actually are going to be pulling raffles right now. Um, and I should have mentioned that at the onset, but for those that registered for this event prior to June 9th, you were put into a raffle to receive um, some Red Sox face coverings, which were just made by our team, and we will be able to ship those to you. So um, the first winner is Alexandra Lennon-Simon. Um, and again, this is weird. I can't see Alexandra right now, but you're out there, I'm sure. Jane Hershey uh, is the next one. Um, and the next one is... Mona Lisa Smith is number three. We have two more winners coming up. And just so you know, Patty will be following up with all of you um, and will be getting your addresses to mail these to you. The fourth winner is Nancy Rosu. I, I apologize if I'm saying your last name wrong. And Wanda Gear is the last winner. That's awesome. So um, thank you all, Alexandra, Jane, Mona Lisa, Nancy, and Wanda for registering early for this event. Um, I did want to take a moment to thank our amazing panel panelists. I mean, like I said, I could go on for the rest of the day talking about this stuff because so much, unfortunately, of what happens, I think, inherent to working virtually and from home is you're like in this bubble and you don't get this breadth of information and perspective that we so much need right now from our peers um, across this industry. And just sharing a little bit about your experiences, for me at least, has been incredibly helpful. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of our attendees today. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch. All the attendees out there that were listening for this, for this morning, we really appreciate your time. We know you probably have 100 other Zooms to get to today. It's been a busy, busy, crazy year. Um, we, we hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of the week, wonderful rest of the summer. When you click exit at the bottom of this Zoom, you will be prompted to take a very short four question survey. And those answers will be able to help us inform the next event and gathering that we do. We're hoping to try to do something similar at the end of this summer, beginning of the fall. And then maybe, maybe, fingers crossed, we can convene everybody back at Fenway Park late November-ish um, for breakfast so we can all get together. But we, that is totally still up in the air given um, 
uncertainties. So again, uh, thank you so much to our panelists for being here. Thank you so much, Christina Gordon, Women's Foundation of Boston, for partnering with us this morning. Wonderful event. Thank you all. Best of luck and we'll be in touch.